Hello and welcome to my talk. Uh, my name is Jack Ritger. I am a artist, activist, and writer. I am uh, physically based in Boston, Massachusetts, but digitally I hail from the New Models Discord and the Do Not Research community. Um, so today I will pre be presenting a part one of a two-part lecture called Digital Local. Part one is a prehistory of viral media. Um, what, I will be, what I will be presenting is a collection of moments in history and analyzing them through our, th our current concept of viral media. So what makes something viral? In my view, it needs to be uh, confrontational. It needs to feel as if it's exposing or reacting against something, something that is not welcome into the media um, as it stands currently. Um, it has this kind of uh, bottom-up, grassroots feeling and it's embedded with a sense of populism. So that's kind of what I'm gonna be talking about when I think, um, you know, when I use the word uh, viral media. Um, and we're gonna be thinking about how viral media catalyzes uh, new collectives, new groups of people that come together and get caught in the eddy in the waves that ripple out from each of these viral moments. This talk will attempt to, de this talk will attempt to define the dynamics that characterize these moments in the hopes of better understanding our current shifting uh, multi-dimensional uh, media environment. So first up, uh, a little bit about my work as a visual artist. This, um, this piece here is, uh, is called uh, Blind House One that I made in 2013. Um, this was a period um, after I graduated from uh, college where I was uh, living in my parents' basement and you know, I had a lot of uh, college debt and so I was really thinking about debt um, as this uh, you know, like virtual system that you are kind of like, you know, you kind of like take on this debt or this like speculative value and you kind of embody that. Um, this is also soon after the uh, 2008, uh, um, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 2008 mor um, uh, mortgage collapse. And so the symbol of the suburban house kind of like was taking on new meaning. Um, so I was thinking about all of these things and I captured this digital photograph and then spent months painstakingly removing the uh, doors and windows and um, really becoming really embedded within this uh, aesthetic and kind of like a pixel by pixel uh, manipulation technique. And it was through this process that I kind of was able to um, uncover um, a new kind of like relationship to this symbol. And I started thinking about the houses not as um, a, you know, a domicile built for human life, but really as a de-virtualization of this virtual system of debt. Um, so that's like a, little, a little bit about my artistic process. It's kind of like a, um, it's kind of like a, a, a artistic research. So, you know, really trying to get involved with these aesthetics and think about them um, in kind of like an art, artistic way. Um, in, a, in, a, in addition to visual art, I'm also kind of like a uh, recreational model maker. You know, I, I like to, uh, you know, look at the world and create visualizations and diagrams and ways to explain it. You know, I like to think of these things as, uh, as, a, as a toy models. You know, there's something to play with. It's a snapshot of a moment. It's not, you know, all encompassing and it, you know, doesn't really hold up under scrutiny, but that's okay. It allows us to like think about something, like start a conversation. So this model here, um, is this is what I this this is how I see um, media working, and I call it information space rather than kind of like media ecosystem or something like that because information space kind of um, encompasses all of the ways that you know capital, technological systems, media narratives, geopolitics all kind of swirl together in this system. 
all of these little spirals are uh, different vectors of narrative spinning around, people getting caught in them, mixed up, and moving between them all. Um, this is the kind of, uh, there's an image I want you to kind of hold in your head as we move on and think about narratives moving around in this way. Uh, to zoom in a little bit further, this is the um, anatomy of viral media model here. And in keeping with, with uh, this year's theme of bubbles, um, we can think about a viral moment as an attention bubble where it you know, starts with this media catalyst and then grows and grows and grows and you know, has this kind of like rise and fall and going through different forms of media, different speeds of media. So you can think about like a podcast being this really quick reaction and then longer, more in-depth Twitter threads and then it hits the late night, you know, uh, scripted uh, TV shows, then eventually comes out in like a magazine and then eventually completely dies out into, you know, ironic memes and, and really like weird niche uh, podcasts and things like that. So, as this bubble rises and falls, there's a moment when on this uprise where there's an opportunity if you're placed uh, properly within the, within the information system to influence kind of higher levels um, in, of, of, a, of, a, of a influence of narrative. So, you know, it could um, be pushing public discourse or policy shaping and even um, reaching to the level of like a new political legitimation narrative. So one thing that's important about this, about, about the attention bubble is at that, at that, the, uh, at the, uh, at the uh, drop off at the end, this is a moment when um, new, uh, uh, like, like as it rises and falls, people become really invested in these stories and, and um, it, can, it can catalyze new communities. And I've started calling these new communities a, 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 a digital local. So as the bubble drops off, there's people that stay and they kind of spin together and kind of form together into new collectives and you know, have new um, ways of understanding the world. Okay, so now that we got the, the, a, a couple definitions and models under our belt, we're going to move forward um, with part one, which is analogs. And we're going to, we're, we're going to be looking at um, moments um, before digitalization and uh, thinking about them in terms of viral media and um, the, the, uh, the uh, communities that spiral outwards as well as the, the lasting influence that these viral moments have to impact um, uh, information space in the future. Okay, so here we go. So first up, we're gonna be talking about spiritualism, or as I've been calling it, the, the seance fad. And rather than thinking about this as a you know, pseudo-religious movement, I'm trying to think about it in terms of viral media, like I just said. And so the, the seance fad is kind of this, um, this like grassroots, uh, nascent uh, entertainment industry that sprung up in the, you know, the mid-19th century, and it, it really was uh, kicked off by the uh, Fox sisters. They were like the original uh, seance mediums. Um, they had a, a paranormal experience in early childhood that served as a, as a, as a backstory and was kind of like their uh, you know, you know, micro celebrity story that they had this um, experience with um, a spirit in their house that would communicate them through, through these uh, wrappings that would kind of uh, be translated into different messages that they were receiving. They held uh, seances in these very dimly lit drawing rooms where in this almost pitch black environment, your eyes open up really bright and kind of uh, new images and new uh, experiences can enter you through this. Later, as their, uh, their uh, uh, mediumship business was failing, they were offered a, a quite a large sum of money for the time to to do a tell-all expose about how their mediumship business was a complete hoax, and they revealed all of their methods. So essentially debunking, um, um, debunking the seance profession and mediumship itself. Rather than this uh, dealing a death blow to spiritualism as this 
article uh, portrays, it did the opposite. It, it open sourced the techniques for performing seances and it only grew in popularity and more and more. So, <clears throat> let's see. so spiritualism was a way that, um, uh, so spiritualism and seance was derived from a uh, circulation of images of seances where the, the uh, photographic emulsion process was a way of uh, proving the existence of spirits. Um, so these images of the Cottonley Fairies that were circulated by Arthur Cronin Doyle in Harper's, that the, you know, these were presented as a definitive proof of spirits. Um, you know, this was like, of course, a, you know, a staged hoax, but the idea that a photograph is a scientific medium that offered definitive proof um, kind of sets up the, uh, the uh, binary between uh, truth and false and, and reality and, and, a, and a hoax that we still see today. This is kind of like the, the essential like binary bias of media where you need to force a story into this uh, true or false dynamic. At the same time, um, <clears throat> at the same time, um, uh, at the same time uh, uh, photographs were also used to disprove the uh, spiritually, uh, there were, at the same time the uh, photography was used to disprove the seances and expose them as, as hoaxes, but this also, um, this like debunking also just further uh, uh, pushed them into being even more popular. So Sir Arthur Conan Doyle here on the left, uh, you know, he, He's standing here with like proof evidence of like a spirit with him. Um, on the other side is the uh, famous illusionist Harry Houdini. He was um, he incorporated debunking into his uh, stage show, where at the beginning of his show he would perform the techniques of the séance and show how that it was, um, you know, how it was a hoax. In doing so, he would bring the audience into the performance with them, and so you would know that it was all real. There was no actual spirits taking place. There's no actual magic. But then he would go on to, um, you know, create this like incredible illusion. You know, this is really the beginning of like an entertainment industry where you know that it's not like real, but you can kind of like partake in it together. Whereas author Conan Doyle is really obsessed with. Um, spiritualism and, and uh, you know, creating these like real stories, these like real um, heightened experiences. Let's see, is this gonna play? Builds our meaning. Oh, just playing. Okay, wait, I'm just gonna go back, sorry. So these are some, um, in, uh, these are, these are some pictures of the uh, debunking uh, photographs that would be snuck into the uh, seance room and capture the you know, pr uh, proof that this is not really a um, seance happening. What you're seeing here is uh, ectoplasm also tying in with this year's um, theme. Uh, ectoplasm performance where a small bit of fabric would be um, pulled out of a sleeve or even regurgitated and then this fabric would be floating around the room using breath in this incredibly like dark dimly lit room it would look as if a spirit had taken physical form in the room with you I find these pictures to be incredibly uh, violent you know you can just think about the uh, women performing these like incredibly physically taxing um, spiritualist uh, performances and 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 the uh, newspapers are incentivizing uh, proof that this is not real and so they would sneak these cameras and capture these photos at this like really inopportune moments and it you know it it really is uh, it really is revealing the way that media generates images and like generates situations So um, another way that um, 
photography um, created magic is um, with pixelation. So rather than a pixel like we think of like on a computer screen, pixelation is, is coming from the word pixies. So the idea is that this stop motion that was created with humans were pixies that you couldn't see that were moving the objects around the screen or moving the people around the screen. Um, and this is like kind of like a celebration of the elemental, um, the like uh, like core elements of the photo of the uh, film uh, 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 filming process, where you can like stop the frame and reposition things, and then take another frame and create this like magic on screen. The pixelation process persists today, and you can see it on like TikTok with these transition videos where people like jump into like another outfit. The like pleasure of these elemental uh, filmic uh, qualities are are just really enjoyable. So here I want to throw up another model. This is the Eddy model. Um, so basically, the idea with this is that there's an event or trend, and then the 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 uh, event or trend is like a rock in the stream, and um, as the information system flows over it, 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 it winds back in on itself. So there's, you know, this kind of like first reaction that flywheels into something and there's a counter reaction and then a, you know, longer term reaction that could come into conflict with the shorter term counter reaction. So we can see this with the, uh, the uh, binary bias reaction to the sensationalized uh, seance media. So the um, practice of spiritualism found its way into uh, the world of fashion with Elsa Scaparelli. On the right, you'll see Elsa um, with her parents or Italian aristocrats. Uh, she fled New York for, uh, sorry, she fled Italy for New York to escape uh, arranged marriage for a suitor she felt nothing for. In New York, she attended a performance by the world famous Dr. W. D. Kel D. Keller. He was a stage medium performing a mentalist uh, mind reading and, and other acts, um, but he was like a con man by all, by all accounts. Elsa was like extremely taken by his performance and they struck up a, a, a relationship and got married and for many years she was his, um, you know, she kind of like helped him work on his stage show and um, ended up draining her allowance from her parents back home. But it's really clear that uh, uh, De Keller's performance had a real influence on Elsa and this power of the stage and the provocation of belief to generate new audiences and new collectives. From there, she went on to become one of the original um, uh, couture houses, the, Sca the Scaparelli house. She was not an expert in drafting or crafting garments, but had a deaf sense of style and skill for communicating these ideas to a team that led to incredible breakthroughs in fashion. Here are just a couple selections from a, you know, in, uh, incredible contribution. So here on the left is a women's glove um, from winter 1936. In this, you'll see a, um, um, a man's accessory item, the smoking glove, has been subverted and combined with its opposite. The red snakeskin fingernails are, you know, creating a smoking glove for women. In this way, it's kind of a surrealist combination with its opposite here. And um, on the on the right, you'll see um, uh, clips of Edward Bernays who is uh, Freud's nephew, is staging a photo op at the end of a suffragette's march um, where the uh, marchers strike up cigarettes. Uh, the press is already there to, to uh, you know, in the right place to take photos of it and then run a story about how these cigarettes are, are freedom torches. Um, in contrast to Bernays' approach, which is one of marketing and manipulation, operationalization, taking things that are happening in political currents and selling it to a client, I see Scaparelli's approach as um, creating a fantasy that produces desires, and then from those desires are, are moments that are created, you know, women smoking cigarettes together, and the collectivities that may form and, and ripple out as a result from that, all compressed down into one um, accessory object. Scaparelli also uh, collaborated with Salvador Dali and made a, you know, 
um, uh, many incredible works together. So we have a lobster dress on the right and a skeleton dress right there in the middle. And the way the collaboration worked is that you know, Dolly had an automatic writing, automatic drawing process where he would kind of try to go into a state and channel this like unconscious realm and then uh, take those things that he like found in this kind of like unconscious fugue state and, and edit them down and kind of like uh, uh, produce kind of like surrealist combinations. Um, and then he would take those kind of simple instructions like uh, put a lobster on a dress, give it to Scaparelli, and then she would realize that and bring it into the real world through these um, through these just like incredible uh, garments. Something that's really important here is this is this combination game, this this um, the uh, combination of the of the macabre uh, skeleton on the outside with this sultry evening dress. There's something um, really potent about it. It draws you in and it captures your attention and then also pushes you away at the same time. So for Dali, the unconscious, um, you know, it was about accessing this like unconscious plane and everything is kind of like rife with uh, subliminal sexual undertones of everyday objects and the kind of uh, certainty that we have in everyday objects and the symbols of them can be easily undone through the surrealist process. So with the lobster phone, the lobster sex organs are right next to the phone's receiver. So in order to use the phone, you're kind of engaging in a surrealist ecstasy of communication. In this way, we can think about um, we can think about it as viral media as kind of like a theoretical, uh, you know, a, the a, th a, the a theoretical object, and that accessing this unconscious plane is something similar to like a uh, to like a cloud or a platform that we think of now. In these images, it kind of, or in these paintings, um, we can see that even more. So this one in the uh, in the uh, bottom left corner, it looks like kind of like a normal landscape until you look closer and see that there's this X, there's like an order underneath of it that's being revealed through this surrealist practice. So moving away from the, um, you know, world famous artists, um, I don't think that viral media or, or viral art in this case needs to be uh, public. So one of my favorite artists, uh, Henry Darger, who's considered an a outsider artist, but you know maybe we can just call him a recluse. Uh, this is where he lived and worked, um, dedicated his life to creating an incredible body of work that uh, he didn't share with anyone that was only discovered after he passed away. So in this like really cramped quarters, he created these incredible uh, drawings and um, uh, 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 these like um, amazing watercolor panoramas as well as uh, massive um, tomes, these like really long stories and depth stories. And what I see is a, a, a personal uh, virtual reality that's being created here. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a fantasy world and it helps him persist through time. Um, he had an incredibly difficult childhood and he's working through that trauma through this artwork. In this way, you know, it doesn't need to be public. This is like a, vi you know, it, it was like a viral meme that he was just living out for his entire life. And I think that's like incredibly powerful way to think about it in, um, in, in thinking the way, in, in thinking about how viral media can kind of like spiral and persist over time. And I think, th I, I think that's the reason why his work is still incredibly uh, potent and powerful today, as well as through this, um, this kind of like spiraling regenerative process, he was, uh, discovering new techniques that kind of wouldn't be discovered in the in the you know popular art um, system for many many years. So using uh, the uh, uh, using a carbon copy paper to transfer tracings that he found in newspapers and use those figures um, to to uh, create his images. So he may have been an outsider artist, but he was definitely not outside the uh, media um, system that was existing at the time. So um, in thinking about the internet, 
and the the you know core origins of it, Buckminster Fuller's geodesic dome, gives us a clue into how this uh, conception of the World Wide Web was founded. Uh, Buckminster Fuller called the the planet Spaceship Earth, and it's like we're all on this journey together in this interconnected system that will span the entire globe. He, um, the uh, geodesic dome was also um, had overlap with the uh, modernist, uh, brutalist structures and architecture, which which offered a vision of architecture that was greater than like a human's uh, relationship to a building. It was trying to approach the, um, you know, a scale of the sublime, you know, something that could only be found in nature, like a mountain range, but it's like a building that's like beyond human scale. This uh, utopic vision of something beyond the current situation um, had like an incredible uh, ripple effect as um, almost three million people left mainstream society to form informal communities known as communes. Um, the tools that were used to form these communes, the information was uh, developed from the Whole Earth Catalog, which was a cybernetic feedback system that was all bound together through the mail. It's paper media. People would send in contributions of things that they had learned or information they had picked up, and then it would all be packaged and sent out to everybody in this, this uh, feedback loop. And these were uh, ways to live in the commune so like how to like build the con you know how to build your commune but then also kind of new social systems new ways of living that were more in tune with um with the world and kind of forming this uh, whole earth this this spaceship earth And so in this way, there is a, this is kind of like a counter mass media and it's using the mail as a, uh, you know, a cybernetic system. It's kind of like a pre-internet um, interconnected uh, flow of information in this way. And, you know, as this kind of way of thinking about how to use the mail as this uh, information communication device, then comes Ray Johnson who, he, he used the uh, decentralized exchange system created by the mail, uh, created or kind of like put forth by the whole earth catalog. And he would do uh, kind of like provocative, uh, hilarious um, gestures and created what is now known as like mail art. Um, I think Ray Johnson has like OG poster energy. He really was just kind of like doing really funny things. And this is at a time when the uh, fine art world was really becoming in industrialized and professionalized. And he was undercutting his own market um, for selling work by uh, simply mailing it to people and, you know, really uh, devaluing it and using these uh, kind of like everyday objects. And he loved to do these, uh, these, um, these like how-to uh, manuals here. And a funny story about uh, Ray Johnson that kind of illustrates his confrontational approach is um, one day a collector uh, wa uh, wanted to purchase one of his collages but, but lowballed him on the price. And so he returned the next day with a quarter of the collage was, was cut out. And he's like, oh, well, this is, what, this is the price that you offered. So he like cut out a piece of it. And this kind of like, you know, uh, poking fun and being antagonistic towards the art market. Um, is like just like really hilarious. Um, another way that he did this <laughs> was by uh, mailing his work to the Museum of Modern Art Library. And he realized, or he like heard somewhere that like if you just mail it to them, they just put it in a bin. Um, and they like, they like won't throw it out, they just like put it in a bin. And so by doing that, he was able to get his work into the permanent collection of, of, of MoMA simply by, by mailing it. So in this, we'll see, uh, we see his famous uh, uh, bunny character. Um, this was kind of like a meme, you know, it, it, it became synonymous with, with Ray Johnson. It would move out and you could do, you know, he would, he would teach you how to draw it. And so you could do your own version of it. It was as it, as it propagated through these uh, mail art communities. So in 1983, 
um, before me and my brother were born, my parents were part of a mail art collective called Rust Marks, which, which stands for Rubber Stamp Mail Art Exchange. So the way it worked was, oh, and you see right here is an example of one of these copycat Ray Johnson bunnies. Somebody that was in the mail art collective was in like another collective that was like tangentially connected to Ray Johnson. So there was this movement of uh, art that was kind of like dispersing through these like these like little like mail art collectives. So the way it worked is that somebody had a list of everyone in the collective. They would mail out the addresses and updated as new people joined or left, and then you would mail um, a piece of art to everyone on the list, and you would receive something from everyone else. There was a lot of um, using rubber stamps, so this kind of like office uh, stamping tool here being subverted and um, used for making art in a, in a very kind of egalitarian, uh, populist way as well as the postage stamp, which is a communication, um, you know, aesthetic object and currency kind of like all mixed up into one. So as we're saying, uh, something we're very familiar now with today is any uh, online community eventually will face somebody leaving or, you know, like rage quitting. And I found it really interesting that in, in, in my parents' mail art collective in the 80s, there was a similar situation where someone became uh, really uh, frustrated with another member's political provocations. And so they sent out a message to everyone in the collective saying that this is it, I'm leaving. Humdog 1994 um, published an essay about a similar situation that happened in The Well, which was a message board that developed after the Whole Earth Catalog. So this is a theme that we see like over and over again. So, oh, so as <clears throat> so as this uh, decentralized information system, this this communication technology of the mail is uh, producing these these really beautiful collectives. At the same time, it is also being taken up for other um, you know uh, um, uh, consumers' memes uh, means. Uh, one of the more uh, interesting and kind of important stories for understanding the current context today is Richard Devos and Amway and the rise of multi-level marketing. So what we see here is um, this is like an Amway bus, and the way it worked was uh, with multi-level marketing is you would be selling products to people in your um, in your vicinity, kind of like in your neighborhood, and you would lean on personal connections and kind of like pressure people to buy. Uh, whatever object you're, you're uh, you know, you know, whatever product you're trying to sell. An important piece of context here is that the um, uh, uh, during during world during World War II, while all, all of the men in America were drafted, there was a, prop uh, a propaganda campaign to get women into a new social position of going and working in, in, the, in the factories and supporting the war effort. So Rosie the Riveter is like an uh, example of this kind of like women's empowerment strength of going into the factory. After the war, there needed to be a new propaganda campaign in order to get women out of the factory so that the men could like take those jobs back. And that propaganda uh, campaign took the took the form of the character of like the 1950s housewife, and so these like recently empowered women that are now pushed back into kind of a very uh, you know conservative social position, Amway was right there to deliver them a new source of um, of like empowerment through uh, labor. In this case, selling uh, Tupperware to like people in your neighborhood. It's all fine and good. The thing about multi-level marketing that makes it quite nefarious is the way that it encourages you to recruit people into a downline and have them recruit more people into their downline, um, sending the profits upstream. Um, this triangle-shaped structure uh, is incredibly uh, lucrative for the people at the top. And, and because of that, it has persisted over and over and over and uh, grown really, really popular. Um, 
uh, Richard DeVos was uh, uh, very uh, politically um, connected and important. He was the head of the Republican National Convention as well as the Chamber of Commerce. Um, here he is with Gerald Ford on the left, and this is Richard Nixon speaking at an Amway conference the day after his a State of the Union address. Uh, Richard DeVos is really um, instrumental in personalizing and miniaturizing the Reaganomics neoliberal um, new American conservative right-wing movement, you know, um, compressing that down into um, aesthetic objects like this uh, Believe self-help manual, as well as uh, his uh, connections staved off regulation of the MLM market, uh, MLM, um, uh, you know, scam industry, and as a result, has kind of like persisted over time and grown into a uh, quite, f of, of, uh, quite um, powerful lobbying group so in contrast to this, um, you know, our right, uh, right wing American conservatism, I want to turn towards uh, Patrick Kelly, who is an a, a incredible American fashion designer. He started working in a thrift shop in Atlanta and he would modify designer dresses um, to, to kind of like subvert them and make them um, different using kind of like modest means like these uh, buttons. He was an avid collector of black memorabilia, memorabilia and had an affinity for items depicting racial stereotypes that many people found challenging, offensive, or demeaning. He deployed this material ironically in his designs. You can see an example of uh, his collection in this Vogue editorial here in the middle and um, turning himself into kind of like a caricature through this uh, Kelly Lisa here on the right. So he was like really inspired by Scaparelli's uh, uh, funny and uh, you know uh, uh, cheeky uh, con uh, contributions to fashion. Here on the left is a crocodile trench coat with a crocodile shawl that looks like a uh, stuffed animal, but it's all made out of crocodile skin. <laughs> this is a uh, kind of like uh, morose, but also hilarious at the same time. There's something about this that draws you in, pushes you away at the same time. And once you've kind of invested energy into it, it's, it becomes like incredibly sticky and you kind of like spiral into it. I've started calling this approach to aesthetics, the uh, sticky versus friction model, which you see here or you have the sticky content that brings people in until they're hit with the friction point, which reduces your audience, but the people that are left have a higher level of support because there's more buy-in for this, uh, uh, for this uh, you know, after this like frictional dynamic. An artist, I think, that really sums up this uh, sticky uh, friction um, aesthetic is H.R. Uh, Giger, who is a... Um, incredible uh, horror uh, 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 surrealist artist who is brought into the Hollywood system through um, uh, uh, Jodorowsky's Dune, uh, the like, famous uh, hyper object film that never was made because it was outside the scope of what was possible through the Hollywood superstructure. The Dune Pitch Bible circulated through Hollywood and went on to influence, you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, of every, um, you know, horror, uh, sci-fi, fantasy film of the time. Here you can see, as as, as well as uh, the uh, the uh, Dune project brought HR. Um, Brought, brought Giger into uh, collaboration with Dan O'Bannon. They would, they would go on to collaborate, creating the uh, alien uh, xenomorph that you see down here in the, in the, in the corner. Uh, in the middle, you can see him winning the award for the xenomorph. He had gone to uh, Disneyland earlier in the day from the Oscars and refused to take the hat off when he went there. So you can see this very kind of confrontational, sticking his finger in the eye of, of the Hollywood superstructure with his, uh, you know, his, his, uh, his very intense artwork. Um, here are a couple of ways that uh, his work has filtered out into mainstream culture, some homages to, um, to music artists there on the left. Um, at the bottom is a, is a music video he directed for Debbie Harry, as well as a mic stand for Korn. So this is, a, um, this is some spec work that he made for Dune that was never used because, you know, the film was never made, but uh, it was used 
it, it found its way out into popular culture through this incredible ad for uh, Pioneer Sound, Pioneer Zone Sound System. On the left is the uh, Harkunin Throne. The uh, Harkunin Throne was used at the Limelight Club in New York City. This is a legendary club. Um, the upstairs VIP room was the, uh, you know, it was known as the H.R. Giger room. And in this space, uh, New York's uh, creatives, um, creatives and artists and designers would come together to um, talk about politics and art and were, you know, definitely influenced by uh, uh, Giger's vision. You can see two regulars, um, Jean-Paul Gaultier here on the left, and Terry Mugler, who were, um, yeah, as I said, like we're, uh, we're, uh, we're, uh, we're uh, regulars of limelight, Giger's biomechanical horror leaking back out in, into the world through high fashion and setting the tone for a, for a new wave of aesthetics that, that persists today. Um, even though Giger is kind of a, um, uh, you know, is kind of like an underground figure in terms of like mainstream culture, uh, he has been like so popular over the years and it persists today. So you can really see this ability for really potent artwork to generate audiences, um, even if something is niche that will stay with it for, for years and years and years. Here's Alexander McQueen, an, another kind of uh, biomechanical, um, uh, exploration, as well as an homage to the skeleton dress we saw earlier, so the skeleton corset from 1998. So as the uh, as the, as the 80s wound down, we headed into the 90s. There's emergent of, there's the emergence of an aesthetic called Global Village Coffee House. This began as a reaction to computer-driven design aesthetics and brought out a hand-drawn woodcut, um, this like woodcut look. Um, it was very much connected to this like first wave coffee house uh, image of ethical consumerism, it used uh, tribalism and ancient uh, prehistoric motifs to signal this uh, global unity of coming together. This is an example of a, of, a, of a corporate bear hug, taking the legacy of the hippie movement, defanging it and selling it to, uh, to an audience. In reaction to this kind of um, aesthetic recuperation, as well as the um, politics of, of, a, of a global capitalism, we see the uprising, the Battle of Seattle against the World Trade Organization in 1999. Uh, the uh, uh, aesthetics of anarchism needed to be replenished as corporate messaging recuperated these movements. And it's no accident that you know, this took place in Seattle, which is also the birthplace of, of Starbucks, which really is the aesthetic lineage of, of Global Village Coffee House. So now for part two. <laughs> um, so in part two, we're, 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 we're moving from the analog into the fully digital. This period of digitalization, of uh, digitalization of culture, of the economy, of capitalism kind of taking on this new form really was a shift in the way that we think about time and space. And the, on the bottom, you'll see something that's probably familiar to all of the um, uh, music people in the room. You have the uh, analog sine curve that is beautifully smooth, and then the uh, uh, digital version of it, which is this step, this kind of like ugly stairs are going up and down. And you know, this is really the difference between something sounding really good and kind of this digital crunchiness, which of course can be like a beautiful aesthetic in its own. But there is a way in which the analog smoothness can never actually be replicated through digital. But you can get as you can get closer and closer in creating a kind of higher fidelity uh, granularization of that. This shift from uh, analog clock time to uh, a discrete digital uh, clock moving forward. Um, you can also see that. We, um, we can think about that in terms of media and aesthetics where with analog, there's this kind of like smooth perfection to it. There's something about holding the piece of paper in your hand or seeing the painting on the wall, having a real experience in a real room that 
you can try to replicate through digitalism, but you'll never actually really get to that. So a lot of um, this this uh, this uh, digital aesthetic is about trying to recapture that and reconstitute that, and trying to get to higher levels of fidelity and trying to get back to that. So we're going to look at a couple um, uh, a couple viral moments and viral aesthetics. Um, so first up is Coney 2012, Invisible Children. This was an early moment for viral activism, something we're very familiar with today. Just a couple of years ago in 2012, this massive uh, advocacy, advocacy campaign was centered the activists as, you know, we are shaping human history. And it was a transposition of the, of the MLM um, uh, uh, means of distributing products that it, it transposed that into activism by um, putting activists at the center and kind of empowering them to create um, activations in cities. They did a, a big one called like We Are the Night and they kind of like took over these different college campuses and cities. And this thing went supernova viral. It got millions of views on Vimeo and circulated widely on Facebook, this like heart-wrenching documentary um, that you see is still from here. Uh, was the method of distribution and became this like really, really uh, powerful, uh, potent piece of digital media that you know people would like DM you on Facebook all the time. As this uh, two-week attention bubble rose and fell, the amount of attention that came to it really was untenable. As people started to dig into the finances of Invisible Children, they found that the the way the money was being distributed like really wasn't that great, as well as the. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, theory of change of how they were going to actually work this out really wasn't going to be effective. As this attention bubble crashed, as the scrutiny hit, the, uh, the movement's founder and documentary maker unraveled and was seen running naked through Hollywood Hills. Um, Another kind of um, internet aesthetic is, is the internet as a desiring machine. It, it, it wants everything to be made public. It wants to de uh, defame celebrity and bring them down to the level of the user. Everything becomes pornified. Everything becomes public. Um, gender reveal parties are a real scourge, but um, the, uh, it, 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 it is really, uh, it's really remarkable how these images that are generated as a performance of, of learning about the kind of uh, the, uh, the, um, the uh, technological understanding of gender of your child before it's born is, is performed for social media. The, 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 uh, the uh, reaction of it is so important and that really sums up these kinds of new rituals they're derived from the social media presence of these nano influencers. But in 2020, a gender reveal um, party that uh, created a, a massive wildfire in the western part of the United States from a smoke bomb explosion like one you see in this picture. And then recently, it's from a couple weeks ago, a uh, drought in uh, New York City, there was like, or it wasn't New York City, it was New York. There was a drought in this small town, um, but too bad because this couple poisoned their only water supply by dying it all blue. <laughs> the internet is a, it's, it's, a, it's about creating audiences and it, and it heightens the experience of everything, knowing that everyone's watching you. Um, the flaunt your wealth challenge is kind of, uh, you know, a kind of extreme example of this where the, um, it, it heightens the, exper the experience of being wealthy, knowing that people are watching you and, and envious of all of the things as you are, you know, so ditzy, you just fall out of your Lambo and spread your, you know, wealth across the street there. Streisand's house was photographed during a uh, ecological study of the California coast. Um, uh, trying to trace the um, uh, er erosion. Um, uh, Barbara put her PR team to task trying to remove this image from the internet, but this only created an incentive for it to be circulated even wider. This uh, dynamic of the internet is kind of like a, a living organism that um, anything that is acted upon creates a reaction and, cre and, and incentivizes the opposite. Uh, is it, 
in, instead of the Streisand effect, maybe we should maybe we should call it the Streisand affect because these images take on another layer of meaning once you know how they kind of uh, uh, became formalized into something. There's this like other layer on top of it. Um, these are two other examples of images that were attempted to be scrubbed from the internet only to be canonized in this way. Uh, U2 album, who, who remembers this one? <laughs> so the, <laughs> we call it, so, so this is like a really wild thing where, you know, the, the uh, systems of power, these massive technological companies, which are bigger and more powerful than most uh, geopolitical actors, they need to make their power hidden if they use all of the tools at their, at their disposal, in this case, auto-downloading the U2 album onto your device, it exposes, it shows their hand, and people don't like that. So there was a huge reaction against this, and people really hated that they were like forced to put this onto their iPod. And, in, and another way of this kind of frictional dynamic, um, we can think about Nightcore, which is um, a music subgenre that developed from mashup and like many other things. Um, the reason I bring it up here is because it's, it's an example of algorithm defiance where if you post a video on YouTube and it has a DRM protected music in it, then it will be taken down or you'll be forced to monetize for someone else. So this music genre where you simply take a song and put it to 2x speed and, and upload it, you know, most of the time not making any other changes to it, gets around the uh, 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 waveform sensor. And so it's a, it's a way that the uh, algorithm and the internet as a kind of like living organism can be thought of where any uh, uh, way that you try to corral movement just generates more um, movement outside of that. So like really small things have like incredible um, other um, effects. The uh, uh, Twitter UI, the design of just like the quote tweet of how it appears on your screen, developed all kinds of new language with the epic clapback. Um, of course, this uh, this language is recuperated for like marketing reasons, as you can see here. In this constant. Um, in this constant uh, uh, Cold War arms race for authenticity between people posting online and advertisers trying to sell things online, you can you can think of um, what was formerly called native advertising, but now we call it user-generated content. This is kind of like the like golden goose of, of of online advertising now, where you pay an influencer to talk to their audience in their own vernacular. This is just one example of someone who went viral for giving these uh, 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 personal finance tips and then sold her audience um, you know, for, you know, to like Starbucks and Alaska Airlines here. And if you watch these videos, they're identical to the other ones that she posted. It's like the organic content. Here she is um, uh, in this way. They, yeah, that's, that's, that's what user-generated content is, but you can see this. You can see this way that viral media is 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 always trying to be curtailed, and it's something that exists beyond the the uh, space of advertising. But it's always trying to be recuperated and folded back into this advertising capitalist superstructure. One of the kind of latest developments in this uh, in this arm race is the deep fried meme. It's, it's something that is aesthetically encrypted and like so harsh. It's like the harsh noise music of images, it, like makes your eyes bleed. And it, it really is something that's trying to create an image that can, can't be recuperated back into the advertising for now at least. Um, some other ways of um, new kinds of language that are like developing online. We have the parasocial address where you say like, hey chat, Drop a uh, uh, drop a J in the uh, YouTube comments for me right now. Thanks, everybody. The parasocial address is an inversion of the way that viral media creates a community that cycles after it, and it is an inversion of that where it's the community that you're trying to form, and communicating with it is what creates this new kind of like weird parasocial language where in this uh, one-to-many dynamic of live streaming, creating weird phrases like, hey, chat, so that 20 people or 100 people 
watching you are kind of like this one like like big organism that's like shooting out like a bunch of different messages and in this kind of like flowing is flowing text so hey, ASMR ASMR there's something really there's something special about how the internet is not just simply media that you enjoy, but it's a heightened experience that is beyond your, um, uh, it's kind of like, it, it, uh, it, uh, it uh, breaks down the walls and barriers, and it's, it's something that you experience in this like very real, it's kind of like oh, a heightened emotional state. Cringe NFT wealth flaunting is something we're all like really familiar with. Um, I think something that's like really important about cringe NFT wealth flaunting is that the 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 cringe that we feel when we look at like bored apes or this or like the the uh, original uh, Homer Pepe trading card is it's the it's the cringe that we feel makes it more valuable. It's like the more cringe, the more disgusting and, and lame and basic and silly the NFT is, the more valuable it is because it, 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 it makes the purchase of it uh, even more frivolous. So this is like an inversion of, of, uh, of, of how we used to value art. AI art, GAN images, uh, this needs like a whole nother like two hour lecture to kind of like really do justice to, but I'll just leave it here that um, <laughs> uh, these images that I generated this morning with Dolly and Mid Journey are kind of like an incredible step forward in a sensing technology and wrapping up uh, or, the, or the culmination of um, two decades of images posted on social media and indexed through um, text as well as the uh, the um, massive um, capitalist structures that grew up around that all of these things formulating and compressed down into these like single images here but then in a couple weeks oh yeah no it's it's it, whatever is boring becomes banal that that whiplash from something incredibly mind-blowing to just kind of like every day is very uncanny and very unnatural, and it's something that we're going to have to deal with. So another um, aspect of, of uh, digital viral media is the is this jargon maxing, the creation of pre of new prefixes and suffixes, the extreme nanoified core, the way that these these uh, this, like throw a dart on the board and take two things and bring it together, and like there's got to be someone on the internet who is like into that thing and that kind of like creating these new vectors. It creates these incredibly incomprehensible moments. Like gate gate, where someone, where this where this uh, British politician used the wrong gate, and he was checked by a security guard, which he uh, called the security guard a name, and was first called pleb gate, and then the media started calling it gate gate, which is like completely incomprehensible, and it's like lost all meaning at that at that point. But sometimes you can push past this incomprehensible, and it starts to make sense again. So like with surf wave. It's like surf rock and vapor wave, and then and then and then, and then it makes sense again. A, a wave is something you surf. So in this way, we have like incredible incomprehensibility, but then coherence on the other side of it somehow. So I just want to leave. I want to uh, leave us with one last model here at the end. This is a this is a hyperstitional model. This is kind of like my hope and dream for how these uh, these spaces can develop in the future. Um, this is the interdependent ecosystem here at the bottom. You see the attention pool or information space that we saw at the beginning of the talk. Um, from this pool, there's these, there's these silos. These silos are, are, are media bubbles where um, algorithmically uh, uh, advantageous marketing desires are, are, are channeled up and giving extra platform. And you can get caught in these silos. Um, you can get caught in these silos and not have access to things outside of that. But it's the work of um, these in, of it's, it's the work of the interdependent ecosystem and these producer collectives, or these uh, 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 these like collectivities that form around viral media, these digital locals. It is the hope that they can create vectors between the different silos and expose people to things outside of their filter bubble. And in this way, 
we can struggle to work against the totalizing effects of platform capitalism and tech companies building informational solidarity across digital boundaries. Thank you so much. This has been like a real pleasure. Come back for part two tomorrow, the post-internet artists with Abby Puzz. Thank <laughs> you.